Capitol Hill riots. Been some time since we've checked back in on those cases. We've got two big ones today that we want to check in on. We've got Julian Cater and George Tanios. These are two gentlemen who were uh, part of the Capitol Hill riots. And they are uh, they had court today, so they were in in front of a judge today trying to uh, get out of custody. Really, if you recall, this happened back on January 6, and they have been sitting in custody ever since. Many other people in this country get out of custody on bail, especially if they are not uh, criminals, right? If they don't have a criminal history, if they haven't done anything that is particularly heinous, people get out on bail all the time. We've talked about this. Kyle Rittenhouse out on bail. We've talked about uh, Derek Chauvin out on bail. Kim Potter, the officer who shot and killed Dante Wright, she's out on bail. And the list goes on and on and on. People get out of custody all the time. So the question here has been, why have these defendants, why are these defendants in custody for something that's pretty minor, sort of as a protest, a riot. They're still being housed in federal custody. And so there was court today. We're going to check back in. Uh, Adam Classfield over from lawandcrime.com did a live thread on the proceeding. So he called into court and was listening to everything. So we're going to check in with him and we're going to go over to Law and Crime and they're going to walk us through what happened in court. You can see here, these are the two people that we're talking about. So uh, this is one person who's inside the building, inside the congressional building. And then this is another sort of red box that was placed around. This is part of the government's discovery, part of their evidence, saying that there was some bear spray, obviously, that was being sort of you know sprayed around right then and there. So Classfield says, the late Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknicks accused assailants George Tanios and Julian Cater are renewing their pretrial release requests. They filed their motions the day after the DC medical examiner's ruling on Sicknick. And so he went through the thread. And so you recall that we learned back on April, right about April 18th, that Officer Sicknick, many people were saying that he was killed by the MAGA you know, riots. They were saying that there was a fire extinguisher. Remember that the mainstream media was reporting this. It was so prevalent of a uh, of sort of a, a hoax narrative that was being spread all around this country that it even made it into the Democrats impeachment memorandum that was used in the second impeachment of Donald Trump. So this was sort of the great big lie that was being spread around that uh, that Officer Sicknick was killed by fire extinguisher as a result of the riots. Obviously, that didn't happen. We knew that didn't happen because they didn't they, they were they were trying to hide the results for a very long time. Well, we know back in sort of mid April that they finally came to that acknowledgement. They kind of finally released that, hey, he died of natural causes. And we talked about it on this show that even the Capitol Police, they are sort of in denial about it. Remember, they posted this. The medical examiner finds that the U.S. Capitol Police officer Brian Sicknick died of natural causes. This was part of their press release that they sent back on April 19th. It says the U.S. Capitol Police accepts the findings from the D.C. medical examiner that Brian Sicknick died of natural causes. So that's good. They accept it. Then they go on to say, this does not change the fact that he died in the line of duty, courageously defending Congress and the Capitol, which is obviously not, it's just not accurate, right? He died of natural causes. He didn't die in the line of duty. That would have been killed in action, not dying of natural causes, but whatever they're, you know, they're mourning the loss of somebody that they care about. So we'll give them that a benefit on that one. Now they are saying that Cotter and Tanios, you recall this came back on April 19th. They're saying they're each charged with one count, one count of conspiracy to injure an officer, three counts of assault on a federal officer with a dangerous weapon, one count of civil disorder, obstruction and physical violence, all on Capitol grounds, blah, 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 right? A whole slew of charges. Now you can see that, uh, that a good portion of those directly relate to officer Sicknick. And the allegation here was uh, largely that they were using bear spray to sort of assault the officer. So we're going to go through the story here uh, over from Law and Crime, as I mentioned. It says here they do, do not mention their autopsy report in their motion. So the way this works, just to frame this out a little bit, right? We've talked about this a, a lot on this channel, really ever since a lot of these defendants who were part of the Capitol Hill riots, ever since they all got rounded up, the FBI is still working on it, that you know, we, we want to make sure that these individuals, really anybody in this country that is on the receiving end of a dog pile, legally needs to be defended. If there's, you know, if, if the entire country is sort of aligned to make sure that a particular segment of the country gets penalized, that's when, you know, sort of defense attorneys, our ears perk up, at least mine do, not all defense attorneys do, but I say, hey, there's somebody here who needs your help. It's sort of like the bat signal, right? Fly in there and make sure that, that they're not getting railroaded because the first thing that goes anytime that there is sort of an emotional prosecution are things like the presumption of innocence and due process. 
both incredibly important. We've got you know a, a nation of laws here for a reason. And so when you start to see what happened as a result of the Capitol Hill riots, the entire infrastructure sort of organized against these defendants, which is not a good thing. Politically, the media, of course, was was dogpiling on them. Congress people were. Everybody was. They still are. And they actually made it the subject of the impeachment of the president, which, in my opinion, was really kind of the impeachment of the Republican Party, or at least the Trump version of the Republican Party. It was a symbolic sort of attempt to cut the head off of the snake and watch the rest of the body wither away and die. Uh, I'm not sure how effective it was. Arguably, maybe it was, but we'll see. But the point here is the Capitol Hill rioters, the Capitol Hill protesters, they deserve the same due process, the same presumption of innocence as the rest of us. And so when they were being held in custody, myself and others have been scratching our heads going, what the heck is happening here? This is not fair because other people in other parts of the country are being let out of custody on bail. They're being granted release, even though some of their crimes are more heinous than any of the allegations that took place for the January 6th defendants. And I've got some examples of it later on, but let's go through this. Right now, they are trying to get back out of custody. There was a new report that was released saying that Officer Sicknick de did in fact die of natural causes. There was nothing to do with bear spray or a fire extinguisher or anything else. It was just natural causes. So they wanted to renew their motion. They wanted to re-request an attempt to get out of custody given the fact that the medical examiner themselves are confirming it was natural causes. So let's go through the story. It says, the day after DC medical examiners office released a ruling finding that Sicknick died of natural causes, the officers accused assailants filed separate motions for pretrial release. Neither of them mentioned the news of the autopsy or the finding that he died from stroke. So the motions by two attorneys, George Tanios and Julian Cater, running a combined 48 pages, do not even mention Officer Sicknick's name. Quote, it's hard to not think of the events that unfolded on January 6th and not have a visceral reaction, particularly as rioters entered the Capitol building by breaking windows and ramming open doors, says Cater's lawyer Joseph Tacopina in his 28-page brief that was filed today. Julian Cater was not one of them. He never entered the Capitol building, never sought to threaten members of Congress, never intended to forcibly interfere with the peaceful transition of power. Instead, the act attributed to him was a limited, limited and isolated one that never transgressed the barrier that lay directly before him. The alleged act was spraying a canister of bear, bear spray at Sicknick and two other officers. Prosecutors never alleged Sicknick's assault caused his death. And uh, no, they didn't, but everybody else did. Media did. Democrats did. Congress people did. Senators did. Uh, and the list goes on and on. So apparently, uh, at least for Cotter, Cater, he, he was never even in the building, according to his attorney. Cater does not appear to deny the assault outright in his motion for Bond, which does question whether the government has evidence connecting him to the crime. So here's what else they say in there. Specifically, as detailed in the criminal complaint, Mr. Cater is accused of appearing, oh, interesting, appearing to hold such a canister while spraying it in one continuous sweeping motion of his arm from side to side and, quote, in the direction of law enforcement officers while standing as much as eight feet away from them after emphatically yelling out, quote, they just sprayed me, the defense motion states, right? And so they're going to paint this picture of madness, of chaos, which is exactly the right move because not only was that ac accurate, right? We saw all of the videos. We talked about it. We were on the on the show right as it right after it happened. And it was madness. There was a lot of people spraying, a lot of things, a lot of different directions, a lot of smoke, a lot of pepper spray, a lot of uh, everything, right? And some people were, you, you saw that in a lot of videos. People were just sort of, you know, washing their faces off and spitting and things like that because it was everywhere. So who knows whether it was these guys or somebody else. I mean, even the officers were paying, were spraying pepper spray all over the place. So it's kind of madness. And that is a good thing to really magnify if you are a defendant. If you're a defense attorney, of course you're going to say, no, I mean, there was, yeah, there was, there was pepper spray all over the place, bear spray all over the place. It wasn't my client. It could have been him or him or him or him or any one of the other 50 people that were on the camera that we just watched on the video we just watched. Cater's lawyers note that the reference to their client, quote, appearing to hold the canister is less than definitive and took aim at the officers is at best equivocal or doubtful as you might say. According to charging papers, Cotter told Tanios, give me that bear spray. 
an apparent reference to the bear spray. Uh, he says, actually, give me that bear S, right? The, uh, the, uh, the S word there. Going further, then accused co-conspirator in his defense, Tanios denies assaulting any officers with any chemicals. According to his defense attorney, who's with the Federal Public Defender's Office, she says, Mr. Tanios denies conspiring to injure officers, denies aiding and abetting any other officers in any crimes, denies assaulting any officer with a dangerous weapon, denies any physical violence on restricted grounds while carrying a dangerous weapon, denies causing bodily injury. Mr. Tanios asserts his innocence. And given his nonviolent and non-criminal history, he does not pose a danger to the community or any other person. So, you know, that that's a public defender. Federal public defender is very good. In my experience, people who are, who, you know, who know what they're doing, they do a lot of it. Uh, I don't, you know, obviously know Elizabeth Gross, but somebody who, you know, sounds like it's very nuts and bolts, nothing flashy, right? The other attorney was making some arguments. She just said, no, we're, we're, uh, <laughs> we're not given an inch here. Deny, 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 deny. We deny all of that. We maintain our presumption of innocence and we demand due process and release him. We'll see what the judge does. Tanios' lawyers claims the government has slim evidence to the contrary. Other than Mr. Tanios being present, the video clips fail to show much at all in terms of the criminal acts allegedly committed by him said his attorney. The video clips failed to show any intent to harm officers, knowledge that officers would be injured, or any agreement by Mr. Tanios to do harm. Video clips failed to show that he used any weapon, chemical spray, or inflammatory agent. Furthermore, the video clips failed to show Tanios provided Cater with any item that could be used to injure the officers at the Capitol. This is a far cry from strong evidence, and it is only it is the only evidence the government relied upon, right? So it's, it's terrible evidence. It's not any good. And you know, it's their burden. So this attorney's just like I said, very nuts and bolts, making sure that it's their burden. They've got the burden to produce the evidence, burden of production, and the burden of presentation, right? The, they, the burden of proof is what they have to, to meet. And, you know, this is something that's not uncommon. This happens regularly. Think about the old town or the 6th Street or the avenue, whatever that avenue is in your city or whatever street that is in your city that everybody goes to and, and gets rowdy, right? If there's a big madness, if there's a big event, a lot of people are uh, engaged in fights. Happens all the time here in Scottsdale right down the street, right? This, the police sort of are on bicycles. They're just rounding everybody up, taking them downtown, throwing them in the jails, letting the courts and the lawyers and the, and the prosecutors sort everything out the next day. Oftentimes, it's, it's, the evidence is bad because they don't really have much of anything. And so when you start to piece it all together, you recognize that this person just kind of got caught up in something that maybe they shouldn't have been there. Maybe they weren't the most innocent person there, but the evidence is not enough to convict them of a crime. But the police just round everybody up, throw them in, in, into the back of a squad car, drive them all down to the station and figure they can deal with it the next day. The problem is... That person now has to hire a lawyer. They've already had their liberty deprived for that night. They have, you know, pending criminal charges. They've got the sort of the stain of criminality on them that's going to exist in public records and court documents and mugshot websites and everything all over the place. And somehow, you know, that's not an infraction on any of their freedom. And there's no compensation or anything that they can be compensated for as a result of that deprivation. But I digress. That's a whole separate topic. What the heck am I even talking about? Let's get back to the Capitol Hill people. Though neither of the briefs mentioned Signet, both mentioned the D.C. Circuit ruling that has been proved to be a boon for numerous Capitol riot suspects. The case of the so-called zip tie guy, Eric Munchell, who was spotted traipsing around the Senate carrying tactical restraints. In a ruling that ultimately led to pretrial release for Munchell, the zip tie guy, and his mother, the D.C. Circuit raised the bar for the government to keep other members of the Trump mob locked up until juries hear their cases. Cater noted that multiple members of the extremist Proud Boy groups have benefited from that precedent, as has Hunter Emmicke, charged with breaking a window of the building, and Mark Leffing well, who allegedly struck an officer as authorities tried to stop a group that had broken into the Capitol. So there was a court of appeals ruling that came back down and said, basically, you know, you guys are being ridiculous here. A lot of people in this country get charged with crimes. A lot of them are more heinous than breaking a window or sort of, you know, trespassing onto government property, which is essentially what this was. This was a government building, a very important government building, one with a lot of importance and a lot of sacredness. And you know, I agree with everybody that what we saw there was reprehensible and grotesque. And I've never endorsed it or, or been somebody who supports it or tries to make excuses 
for it. But at the same time, we want to make sure that the people who are being charged with crimes here, who are on the receiving end of the dog pile, or at the very pot bottom of the pack, that they get the same uh, uh, rights and privileges that all of us are afforded. We have to demand that they get it. Otherwise, if we just take certain contingents of our society and say, oh, those people don't deserve rights because what they did was really bad. Oh, Derek Chauvin doesn't deserve the presumption of innocence because we saw the video. We don't need actually a trial. Why, are we, why do we even need to do this stuff? You know, that is when these principles and concepts have to be fought for even harder in these certain circumstances. So that is law and crime. We also have Zoe Tillman who gave us some good insight as to what was happening today, said, hello from Judge Hogan's virtual courtroom, where arguments are set to begin shortly on release motions filed by the two who have been charged, Julian Cater and George Tanios. And she gave us a clip from the preliminary statement here, says uh, this, this is the, a little bit of the clip that we were reading about from Cater's preliminary motion. At the outset, the defense recognizes the surrounding circumstances. In this case, they evoke emotion. But we saw here Julian Cater was not one of them, never entered the building. The act attributed to him was limited and isolated. According to the detailed criminal complaint that was filed in docket number, that singular act of using a bear spray canister, which he personally did not purchase or carry to the Capitol, occurred as much as eight feet away from officers only after he emphatically yelled out that he himself was just sprayed. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he is sort of, you know, I guess, I guess maybe detailing the if you punch me, I punch you back motif, which is not really a good defense, but it's understandable, right? He got sprayed. So they're just trying to provide some context. Clearly, the circumstances giving rise to this case are extraordinarily unique. In accordance with the fact below as discussed, many defendants charged with violent or aggressive behavior have been released pending trial. These factors, coupled with the upstanding history and characteristics of Mr. Cater, who has, priorly, who has absolutely no prior contact with the criminal justice system support his pre-release, his pre-trial release. In fact, any notion that he poses a risk of flight or a danger to the community is undercut by the dozen and a half letters attached to his submission. In those letters, people who know Mr. Cater best extol his exemplary background and character. Accordingly, for the reasons set forth in detail below, the defense requested he be released and they put together this bail package with stringent pre-trial conditions. And listen to this. Listen to what they're offering. This is massive. $15 million bond package secured by five properties comprising approximately $1.5 million in equity. Guaranteed by 16 family members who will co-sign as financially responsible sureties home detention with electronic monitoring and a condition that Mr. Cater surrender any and all passports in his possession for an assault case essentially this is what it is a trespass and an assault case which is uh, arguable right the evidence here is shoddy at best as we have seen it's bear spray and a canister with some imagery from madness we now know officer sicknick had didn't die from that it was natural causes it had nothing to do with it and allegedly he was the officer involved in any of this stuff so the assault charges could stick even without proof of, of causation of death obviously if they had uh, if their assault with the bear, bear spray had led to officer sicknick's death then they would be charged with more serious crimes but that didn't happen and there's not even any indication from what we know that the bear spray landed on sicknick to this to the extent that the bear spray impacted sicknick right might have physically hit his body but we don't know as, as far as i know whether there was a medical report or examination that said anything from the bear spray was consequential in his death it's not it wasn't contributing to it at all so would it have been an assault if there's no sort of physical evidence that it actually landed on him, right? There's people spraying stuff all over the place. Was it the, these guys bear spray or somebody else's bear spray? Or was it the officer's bear spray? Cause they were also spraying from multiple different directions. We've watched a lot of the videos here as I'm sure you have. So the, the question here, why is he still in custody? He's got no criminal record at all. Not a flight risk from what we can see here. We've got the family now posting up $15 million in bond for a trespass case, essentially, is what this is. 16 family members are going to co-sign. They're going to put up five of their properties as collateral, $1.5 million in equity, to get him out of custody. And these judges are going, gosh, I don't know. You know, these people are a threat to our democracy. They're, we're, we're, they're dangerous. They're dangerous to society. And they're a flight risk. 
they're not. It, it's not accurate. This this is more than reasonable. If this guy does not get out of custody, oh my goodness, that is a travesty of justice. I think that he will now that we have a D.C. Circuit Court ruling. We have a very generous bond. We have precedent now that other defendants are being released. But my gosh, it's April. It's going to be May by the time it gets out. By the, by the time this guy gets out of custody, many other people around the country have in fact been released. I want to share an article that I found over from American Greatness. This is sort of a, a summation of why Sicknick's narrative failed. It says the Fed's non-existent case against the alleged Sicknick assailants. The cause of the Capitol Police officer Brian Sicknick's untimely death on January 6th is finally settled, but the prosecution of his alleged attackers rages on. After months of dishonest accounts about what happened to Sicknick, first that he was bludgeoned to death by the insurrectionist with a fire extinguisher, and then that he died of an allergic reaction to bear spray, the D.C. Medical Examiner's Office confirmed that he died of stroke. The chemical sprayed in his direction during the chaos outside the Capitol on January 6th did not contribute to his death, according to uh, this reporter. The... The uh, it, it, the article continues in its haste to bolster the new narrative maintaining Sicknick was killed by rioters wielding Baird spray. The acting attorney general was in on the lie from the start. Justice Department charged two men with the attack. We just talked about him. George Tanios, Julian Cotter were arrested March 14th and charged with several crimes, including four counts related to possession of a deadly or use of a dangerous weapon, which is the bear spray. Allegedly, they've been behind bars ever since, ever since. Both were transported to the nation's capital, where they joined dozens of January 6th detainees. They were held in solitary confinement in D.C. jail. A judge on Tuesday will consider motions filed by their attorneys, which was today, to release both defendants. They deny all charges. As uh, this reporter has uh, reported in the past, federal courts at the direction of Joe Biden's Justice Department are denying bond to nonviolent protesters as their cases continue to slow slog through an intentionally overloaded D.C judicial system another thing that i've screamed about this reporter is a uh, julie kelly over at amgreatness.com so go check her out and so you know this is something i've been i've been saying that uh the government prosecutors in this case have filed motions saying oh, we're, we're overloaded we're too busy so we need continuances they asked for 60 day continuances which, which look wouldn't be that bad if people were out of custody you sort of get one or the other. You don't get more time on your case the same at the same time that you're demanding that nobody gets out of custody. Well, because they're they're opposing interests. The people are want to get out of custody. They want a resolution on their case quickly so that they can get back to living their lives. They're being penalized because the government can't get their act together because they, you know, they're so overloaded. They need 60 day continuances. Their 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 systems are overloaded in DC, even though, you know, it's 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 the center of our government, right? They should have more resources than any other jurisdiction in this entire country. And for some reason, they don't. They can't even process something like another 300 additional cases that are working their way as a result of the January 6th stuff. So anyways, they're denying bond. The presumption of innocence has been suspended for Trump supporters involved in the January 6th protest, largely based on supposed thought crime of doubting the legitimacy of the election. Before announcing his ruling, a federal magistrate berated Tanios from the bench Everyone in our country knows what happened on January 6th, said Judge Michael Alloy during a March 22nd hearing. Says, we also generally know that they were supporting the president who would not accept that he was defeated in an election. So we have created this culture radicalized by hate and just refusal to really accept the result of a democratic process. Don't you love when judges just scold you like a child from the bench? Oh my gosh. Alloy also suggested the bear spray killed Sicknick. It was surreal, the judge said. Okay, so that was inaccurate, right? Surreal to see a video of an officer who's no longer with us and describe what happened as an assault on our nation's home. Very dramatic. Law enforcement officials have argued in court pleadings the defendants shouldn't have unfettered access to tens of thousands of hours of, of video evidence because they might pass along the information to those who wish to attack the Capitol again. You see this? Law enforcement is arguing that we're going to keep you in custody, not let you out. We're going to, nope, no bond, no bail. Okay, even though you have the presumption of innocence, even though our, our you know, system says that technically you're innocent right now and that our laws heavily favor people getting out of custody because of that fact, 
right? If you're presumed innocent, then why are we penalizing you by ripping you away from your livelihood unless the threshold is extremely high, unless you're going to leave the country and not come back to court and there's nothing we can do to ensure that you come back or you are a danger to the community and there's nothing we can do to prevent that from happening. Then we'll keep you in custody. But that standard hasn't been met here. And they want to keep you in there. Then when they're not letting you out, they need a continuance. They need another 60 days in order to work their cases up. So while you're rotting away in custody, they need more time to do their work. All right. Then when you want to defend yourself, they're arguing in court pleadings. Oh, no, you shouldn't have unfettered access to any of this stuff. No, 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 no unfettered access because you might want to attack the Capitol again. Instead, according to a recent political article, prosecutors are, quote, working to build an archive a video that would permit defendants to peruse relevant clips, but sharply restrict their access and permit prosecutors a chance to object if they feel any such footage could be misused or present a risk. This appears to be the situation for Tanios and Cater. An attorney for Tanios accused the government of presenting only tiny, limited seconds of evidence and refusing to allow the defense team an opportunity to see the rest. <laughs> the, we see limited interpretation of videos and their view of those videos because they are tiny little pieces of them handpicked by the government to show the court. The sketchy photographic evidence against Tanios and Cotter included in charging documents isn't the government's only problem. Law enforcement doesn't know for certain if they use pepper spray at all. Under questioning by Tanios's lawyer last month, FBI Special Agent Riley Palmertree could not confirm that either man pulled the trigger on the bear spray can. Here's what the attorney said. Did Cater use the bear spray that day? The FBI agent says, not that I know of, but that's for further investigation. The investigation is still going on regarding the bear sprays. Attorney says, okay, so it's your understanding that Cater used a small canister of OC spray with the black handle that was sort of like on a keychain or could be a keychain. FBI agent says, that's according to my investigation, which is still going on. Your attorney says, you don't have any reason to believe that the bear spray was deployed that day at all, do you? Agent says, I have the bear spray cans myself, and I haven't submitted them for analysis, so that's what I would need to do. It's a very serious thing, and I have to be sure on, in a scientific way, the best that I can. So no, ev no evidence that they even used it. So are you keeping count now? You're just rolling it up. What a travesty of justice this is. I don't care what side of the political aisle you are on. This is a joke. This is holding people in custody, absent good cause. This is asking for continuance, absent good cause. And this is doing so without evidence that is justifiable, in my opinion. You have the FBI agent himself saying, well, we don't even know if he used the bear spray. Would you have any other evidence of an assault or what is the deadly weapon? Because I didn't see any guns there. If it's all deadly weapons charges, they didn't use the bear spray. Is that still a deadly weapon? And then when you want to defend yourself, you don't even get any evidence. Isn't that nice? It's our government. Here we've got, in a separate filing, Julian Cater's lawyers argued their client and Tanios were sprayed by others in the crowd perhaps police officers, and never even used the bear spray. The government even admitted in its affidavit that Cater at one point yelled out, they just sprayed me. Therefore, it's a strong possibility the officers, including Sicknick, who reportedly told the family members he was hit by pepper spray during the protest, were sprayed by something other than the bear repellent. Cater's family is asking the court to release him on a $15 million bond guaranteed by 16 family members, as one journalist noted. Judge Thomas Hogan will hear the case on Tuesday and then decide whether to keep Cotter and Tanius behind bars until their next court date, which is going to be in May. So that's coming up. There's no reason to keep these men in jail, Julie Kelly says, let alone in solitary confinement. Cherry pick video evidence does not support the weapons charges against them. The chief investigator confessed no evidence exists to prove the can of bear spray was ever used or that Cotter or anyone sprayed it, including the police officers. Justice Department's refusal to allow access to video evidence raises plenty of red flags. Neither man has a criminal record. Tanios and Cotter pose no threat to society. Their only crime, as is the case with hundreds of nonviolent capital protesters, was supporting Donald Trump and daring to question the validity of the 2020 presidential elections. A doubt shared by tens of millions of Americans, but nobody on YouTube, of course, and yours truly also, right? We love Joe Biden over here. All right, so let's take a look at some questions and see what people over at our community on watchingthewatchers.locals.com have to say. 
and for some reason my slides aren't syncing, so I am now having to open our backup solution, which is happening right now. So give me one quick second, and it looks like we've got uh, we've got this queued up. We have our first question over from Gregory Nichols. Says Robert, I've been focusing on a project the past couple of days. I'm in Florida. End of night, two white women are having a debate discussion over Chauvin. Views followed along skin color. But what was shocking to me was when the black lady became vehement. When one white lady said that Floyd was in the car, the black lady said he was never in the car. Read the transcripts. That video isn't what's real. So that's an interesting uh, observation that you have there, Gregory. You know, I think that there are, of course, going to be racial components in any, any conversation surrounding Chauvin. I do notice, I remember that uh, A.G. Nelson, uh, Ellison, who was, of course, the A.G. who was uh, managing that case out of Minnesota, actually came out and said that he felt bad for Chauvin very recently and that he didn't think it had anything to do with race. And, you know, I, I'm not I'm not real sure that I disagree with him. I made that point about this a lot on this channel, right? Every time there's police brutality or police interactions that are taking place in this country, everybody wants to jump onto this, you know, this narrative that it's all about racism. And I've, I've said this many times on this show. I've seen black cops beat the heck out of black people. I've seen white cops beat the heck out of white people. I've seen Hispanic cops bleat the, beat the heck out of Hispanic people. I've seen white cops beat black people and black cops beat white people. I've seen it all. I've seen a smorgasbord of police beatings and police brutality and police misconduct that crosses the boundaries of race and demographics. Isn't that a beautiful thing? The police are equal opportunity beaters. They just beat the hell out of everybody. I mean, it, yeah, it happens, I, I would say, uh, you know, I don't even know what the data says on this, but, you know, disproportionately in certain communities. But when you start running the data, you can get into really dicey water, right? You can say that, yes, uh, there are more. There are technically a higher number of white people in this country who are killed by police than there are black people. But then, when you sort of you know normalize the numbers based on population, then you say, well, actually, you know, as a percent of population, it does look like black people are actually being killed by officers more. But then you start normalizing those numbers based on number of arrests, and you say, okay, well, yes, technically that. African Americans are a smaller segment of the country in terms of percentage of demographics, percentage of population, but they are responsible for a higher number of arrests. And so you say, well, of course they're killed more by, by officers, uh, police, not just white officers, police in general, based on the fact that they're committing more crimes. And then the response to that is, yeah, but it's the police that are being racist and overly penalizing and overly punitive in their demographics, in their neighborhoods. If the police weren't racist, then we wouldn't have this hyper focus on certain communities and certain demographics. And so you can see, you know, how you can sort of just keep this conversation can spiral on and on and on. It's like the song that never ends, right? It just keeps going on and on, my friends. And we all have to have that stuck in our head now because I just brought it up. So let's see what else we've got. Liberty or Death says, this is amazing. If these people were able to have their right to a speedy trial, they would be out of jail if had been convicted. What Exactly right, right? Yeah, he says, what is the penalty for trespass in Arizona? I'm not sure about D.C., but in Texas, it's a misdemeanor, max of a few grand and six months. Yeah, so Liberty is exactly right. I mean, for, you know, for most trespass cases, it's diversion. It's you, you go take a class. So let's say, for example, that you're at a baseball game. They ask you to leave. You don't leave. You get thrown out. Trespass, right? Cause a commotion, disorderly conduct, all of those things probably going to take an alcohol class or an adult responsibility class and have your criminal charges dismissed. Now, let's say you did something that was more serious, right? Like you trespassed into a government building and you broke a window and you're very mad about it. In Arizona, it's still a misdemeanor. It's still a class one misdemeanor unless they wanted to tack on some felony charges and maybe say that the damage you caused reached a, th reached a certain threshold monetarily speaking that it justifies a felony charge or it is a, you know, uh, there's some aggravating factor that would take it out of misdemeanor status. But even then, a misdemeanor status is six months max. And almost nobody gets that for misdemeanors, especially if you've got no criminal record, no priors, nothing like that. It's a, it's a slap on the wrist. And here, right, if these guys have been in custody since, let's say, mid-January, they've been in there. They, they're, you know, they've done three months of time at least. And they would probably would have done less than that had they gone to trial and lost and a judge sentenced them. Would they get six months? I doubt it. So those are great questions. Thank you so much for sending those over to us over at Watching the Watchers. 
www.locals.com if you want to support the show. That's the place to do it, and we really appreciate it. You can download a free copy of my book. It's called Beginning to Winning, also available on Amazon. You can download a copy of the slides that we just went through, and you can get a new coupon for my Existence Systems course, which is available at robertgruller.com. I'd invite you to go check that out. We really appreciate all your support.